and good afternoon and thank you for coming with such inclement weather I, in Guam we never see anything like this <laughs> so I thank you uh, also to the ICCF and the Oceans Caucus Foundation leadership for holding this important briefing today and for inviting me to participate and I want to thank Mr. Barron here he's been very big help to me getting sponsors for my bill again uh, I thank you to our speakers as well, Mr. Uh, Lichuski of Bumblebee and Mr. Asner of the Advisory Council on Wildlife Trafficking for being with us today and all other important people. We're all important. I commend the work of the Presidential Task Force on the IUU fishing and seafood fraud, which is the culmination uh, the, and the continuation of the many years of effort on the part of leaders and stakeholders in our fishing communities, in the seafood sector, and in our conservation community. We all know here in this room that IUU fishing is a matter of economic security for fishermen and long-term sustainability for America's fishing stocks. It is also a matter of national and regional security IUU is closely associated with other trafficking activity on the high seas and is used by state actors as a uh, provocative act against other nations. We often view security issues through the traditional prism of hard power, but we need to shift these views, particularly in the Asia Pacific region. IUU fishing is a threat to this region's security and we must take steps to address the matter. Uh, Banyan Analytics released a report last year that talks about security in the Pacific Island nations and the IUU fishing or food security was a major, major issue for this region. As we rebalance to the Asia Pacific region, we cannot ignore these types of issues. As I've indicated, IUU has become a significant issue that continues to cause conflicts between countries. This is not unique to the Western Pacific, as I know that your communities in Alaska uh, and the Pacific Northwest, in the Gulf, and up and down the Atlantic seaboard face similar challenges. Given the importance of this issue and the need to give our enforcement agencies the tools to combat this problem, I reintroduced, I introduced it in the last Congress, so now I reintroduced H.R. 774, the IUU Fishing Enforcement Act of 2015, with strong bipartisan support. H.R. 774 would strengthen our nation's enforcement authority and capabilities over foreign IUU fishing activities in our EEZ. That bipartisan support includes Mr. Don Young of Alaska, Mr. Royce, Mr. Ed Royce, Mr. Whitman, Mr. Hunter, and Mr. DeFazio, Mr. Garamendi, and Mr. Lowenthal. Our allies and partners have already taken the lead on this issue. The EU Fisheries Council has implemented trade restrictions on countries who do not cooperate in combating IUU fishing. Our partners like Australia, Palau, and Papua New Guinea have all taken action to curb IUU fishing in their own EEZs. So we cannot continue to lead from behind on this issue. We must take the lead. We must take our leadership role in this important national security matter very, very seriously. It will continue to take a collected effort to prevent IUU fishing from stakeholders the White House and Congress. So I do urge you to ask your member, whoever your member is of Congress, to co-sponsor H.R. 774 so that we can show American leadership on this important economic issue. And let's continue to work together to combat IUU fishing and seafood fraud. Now I also want to thank David Barron for his help and leadership in getting co-sponsors. And I want him to continue, because we need more. The more you get, the more important the bill becomes. And I cannot thank ICCF enough for their help and advocacy in this matter. 
And I thank you for having me here today, and I hope you have a productive dialogue during this briefing this afternoon. And as we say on Guam, see Jews Maasi. Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending. And Congressman Bradalio, thank you so much for reintroducing uh, the pirate fishing bill. Again, my name is Chris Leshevsky. I'm the president and CEO of Bumblebee Seafoods. Um, hopefully you all know our products. Uh, but in addition to tuna, you were the largest buyer of canned salmon out of Alaska. We're the largest player in the sardine business. Um, and again, hold about a 33 share of the U.S. market for shelf-stable seafood and about a 50 share up in Canada. Uh, again, for this meeting, I'd like to thank uh, ICCF and the Congressional Oceans Caucus Foundation for hosting this briefing on one of the most important issues facing our fisheries today, uh, IUU fishing. And again, IUU, again, hopefully you'll get familiar with it. It's a common term out there, illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, or again, a lot of people will call it pirate fishing. It's a multi-billion dollar industry that threatens the health and sustainability of global fishery resources, and it threatens the livelihoods of thousands of Americans who work in the seafood industry. As a founding member and active supporter of the Congressional Oceans Caucus Foundation, Bumblebee is committed to working with Congress to ensure responsible oceans conservation and sustainable fisheries legislation. And that legislation is acted on issues that really should all have bipartisan support. And the, the beauty of sustainability is it really should appeal to Democrats and Republicans alike. It's both social responsibility at the same time, it's good for business and it's good for American business. As North America's largest seafood company, our success depends on healthy oceans and sustainable fisheries. And, you know, it's always an interesting article with the environmental community because the environmental community will attack one issue after another. When they're done, they move on. Well, Bumblebee's been around since 1897. Our business is seafood. We have absolutely no interest in seeing our oceans overfished. So it's an imperative, in fact, our mission that we adhere to practices and policies that ensure the long-term sustainability of fisheries that enable us to provide affordable, nutritious, and a lean source of protein for people today and to help feed a future population globally that's expected to exceed 9 billion people by 2050. Because of Bumblebee's primary focus on seafood, we support global policies and management initiatives that ensure the long-term sustainability of these resources. Again, no single aspect is more important or more central to Bumblebee's sustainability program than ensuring the responsible harvesting and management of fisheries from which we source. And again, that's not only important to the environment and our consumers, but for business as well. Our corporate sustainability platform was really adopted in 2005, and you can argue that's not very long ago, but I gotta tell you, prior to 2005, we never talked about sustainability. It wasn't an issue. You know, it's really over the last 10 years that we started reaching the maximum sustainable yield of our global, of our oceans, global capabilities, and that we really started to make that a center point of what we've done. We tend to think we were one of the first companies in seafood to actually adopt a sustainability policy back in 2005. You know, the key for us is that science is at the core of our approach to fisheries management. And we work with independent science-based assessments of stocks, and these become a key component ensuring that the sourcing, in our sourcing of sustainable seafood. We've engaged third-party experts broadly to assess our various fisheries, not only tuna, but salmon, herring, and the variety of other species we work in, to determine if they're being managed in a sustainable manner. And our assessments, again, are based on the sci scientific stock assessments uh, conducted by various national and international bodies. <coughs> To further these goals, in 2009, Bumblebee became a proud founder of a group called the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation that Dave mentioned. It was really a, an, an attempt initially to recognize that we as an industry needed to step forward to protect our fisheries. And again, if you look at tuna, tuna is a little unique in that tuna swims around the equator. And so it's no single governing body or government that can control the management of tuna. In fact, tuna is managed by a series of re a regional fishery management organizations. And while they have good science, because they're um, multinational bodies, they have to agree on policy unanimously. So now when you get China, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Ecuador, Mexico, Colombia in a room together, what's the chance of agreeing on conservation policies unanimously? It doesn't happen. And so we created the ISSF to basically go beyond um, the RFMOs. And our initial membership 
We're the three biggest companies in the U.S., Starkist, Chicken and the Scene, Bumblebee, the three biggest in Europe, and the two biggest in Asia. We partnered with seven scientists from around the world, but we recognized as industry we wouldn't actually have a lot of credibility. So we partnered with WWF, and I think ISSF is the first body of its kind that has the environmental community partnering with industry and science to bring about sustainable change. Today we're up to 24 members. We represent about 70% of the canned tuna business globally. So we carry a big stick. And again, a lot of the policies we've adopted go far above what governments require. All of these efforts are threatened by the flourishing international business of IUU fishing. Recent estimates indicate that IUU fishing may represent as much as 31% of reported wild capture fisheries globally, valued at up to $23 billion a year. And note that this is generally outside of the U.S. I mean, I have to give credit. In the U.S., National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA do a tremendous job managing our fisheries. You know, our fisheries all being managed extremely well. And, and clearly there are bad players from time to time. But I will tell you, if you get caught violating a fisheries policy in the U.S. by National Marine Fisheries Service, they are a bear to deal with. And the penalties are not ones you want to incur. So we not only track, but we enforce in our country in, in a very harsh manner. In our country, American fishermen are highly regulated, and our laws are enforced both on land and at sea. And again, we don't see IUU as an issue within our borders. But clearly, it's a big global fishery. Where am I? Uh, in fact, our government doesn't, uh, let me keep going. The, I'm going to give you an example of, of an, an issue that's affected the U.S. market. Again, it's one that Bumblebee's not really involved in. But if we take the Bering Sea crab fishery, so again, the Bering Sea, it's kind of half U.S., half Russian. It's a great example of how U.S. fishermen were injured. In 2011, the Alaskan fishery brought approximately 80 million pounds of live crab to market. The official Russian harvest was about 91 million pounds that year, but after really going back and looking at the data, it was actually closer to 190 million pounds. That 98 million pound discrepancy, which most of it flooded into the U.S. market and crashed prices, is attributed to IUU fishing. While this IUU entered the, when the product entered the, the market, crab prices decreased by about 25%, causing huge harm on the American industry. And those are the kind of examples um, that we're trying to combat with this new legislation. Last year, President Obama convened an interagency task force to combat IUU fishing. And again, it basically included a wide range of uh, agencies within the U.S. government. And I'll, I'll be happy to say that the U.S. industry, Bumblebee specifically, and the National Fisheries Institute, which represents almost all seafood companies in North America, is working very closely with the task force and the agencies. Uh, a couple of months ago, they came out with their initial report that came up with 15 recommendations. I would tell you that the seafood industry is absolutely aligned directly with 13 of those, and there are two that we want to have a little bit of further discussion on just on the actual implementation. So again, it's an issue where, again, IUU and battling IUU is something that the U.S. can easily sign up for because it's consistent with how we do business. To support this effort and demonstrate the U.S.'s continuing global leadership in fighting IOU, it's time for Congress to step up and demonstrate leadership in this area by enacting uh, H.R. 774, which is known as the IUU Enforcement Act of 2015, or commonly known to as the Pirate Fishing Act. The bipartisan bill amends various existing international fishery statutes to simplify, streamline, and strengthen existing enforcement protocols. The bill also seeks to improve the capabilities, the capabilities of U.S. law enforcement to detect, track, and prosecute foreign IUU fishing activity. In short, the bill harmonizes and strengthens U.S. fisheries enforcement authorities and capabilities across various fishery statutes in order to better combat and deter foreign IUU fishing. More importantly, H.R. 774 includes provisions necessary for the U.S. to implement the FAO agreement on port state measures to, to prevent, deter, and eliminate IUU fishing. It's an international agreement that was spearheaded by the U.S. and ratified by the U.S. Senate last year. The agreement establishes the first set of global standards to control port access for foreign fishing vessels that engage in illegal fishing activities. The agreement's built on the premise that IUU fishing can be reduced 
if IUU fish can be prevented from entering global commerce. And the most, way of, the most effective way of accomplishing this is to make it difficult for IUU fish to be offloaded in ports. The agreement is modeled after many of the existing measures already in place. In U.S. ports, such as designated ports of entry, mandatory vessel inspections, denying entry or port services to vessels suspected of IUU fishing, and the sharing of information about IUU vessels. Again, we need 25 countries to adopt this treaty. Uh, there's 11 that have already adopted, including the EU. We would be 12, and I would say there's a lot of countries waiting and watching to see what the U.S. will do. We're, we're I'm going to take a break. Right. We're not asking you to end, but the senator has just a, a brief moment to speak with us. So if you don't mind. Don't worry, Chris. Senator, nice to see you. Good to see you again. Thank you. I'll only interrupt Chris briefly um, to express a little bit of appreciation to uh, ICCF. When I got to the Senate, ICCF was already here. Uh, folks like Tom Udall and Rob Portman, uh, now colleagues of mine in the Senate, had been active in it for years. Dave Barron was a true spark plug at creating bipartisan action in this area. And so I quickly said, well, if this is working so well for conservation, let's try to get it involved in oceans. And with David's leadership and John's leadership, we got the OCCF stood up. We have the Oceans Caucus operating in the Senate. And uh, Chris and Bumblebee have been truly excellent uh, partners and supporters. I really appreciate what you are doing and what you have been doing. And uh, we had an early success last year when we got all four of the relevant treaties cleared through the Senate all in one afternoon. That may seem like not a very big accomplishment, but you have to go back nine years to find the previous four treaties that the Senate had cleared. So it was a true bipartisan effort. Um, we're up against a little bit of an administrative problem in that all of the committees have changed leadership. All of the subcommittees have changed leadership. People have moved around on the committees. But once that stabilizes, we look forward to working with uh, Senator Rubio and Senator Peters, who are going to be the chairman and ranking of the Commerce Fishery Subcommittee to get the IUU bill moving through their committee and any support and help and encouragement you could give to those senators to uh, make sure that this is a priority for them would be helpful. It looks like it's lined up to be non-controversial. It's just a question of getting attention to it. So, so far, so good. And uh, again, I'm very grateful for the very good work of David and John and ICCF, and as I like to refer to it, OCCF. So thank you, everybody. Thank Chris, you. the floor is again yours. I appreciate it. Well, I only had one paragraph left anyway, Senator, so <laughs> again, the, the main point I'd like to make about this bill is, and again, I'll just follow, it is non-controversial. It's rare that you're going to see a bill that should both be equally well supported by Democrats and Republicans, but it's also supported by industry and the environmental community. So if I had my partner from WWF up here talking about this bill, he'd also be urging support. So again, it's one of those, clearly we'd like to see Magnuson reauthorized, you know, but we know that's going to have certain challenges. This does not. And again, for those of you that are here representing congressional or senatorial staff, please urge your, your congressmen or congresswomen to sign on to this bill. Have a look at it. And again, look at some of the folks. When, when Dong Yun signs on to a bill, it's got to be pretty non-controversial. You know, Don's pretty much out there. And, and so, again, we've got some great support because it's just a good bill. And it's good for Americans. It's good for business. Thank you. All right. So I'm Marcus Asner, and um, I'm here because I'm on uh, the committee with David. Uh, and I spent nine years before starting Arlen Porter as a federal prosecutor in Manhattan. Um, I'm one of these people who doesn't really have the patience for terms like IUU fishing, and so I just call it stealing fish. Um, Congresswoman, thank you very much. David, thank you very much. Chris, thanks very much. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit today about the Presidential Task Force's recommendations, and I want to take a little bit of a different approach, drawing on my background at having 
uh, actually prosecuted and investigated uh, what I think is one of the largest uh, poaching cases in U.S. history. And what I want to do is walk through that a little bit and um, point out how things like the Port States Measures Act could have helped and how some of the provisions that are outlined in the, in the task force recommendations can actually help going forward and how you, um, being the people who are actually doing the work on the ground, can really push this all forward. There's, there's a lot to be read in the task force recommendations, but I wanted to highlight something here which I thought was very telling because I think this kind of gets to the crux of it. Bad guys don't steal fish because they hate fish. They steal fish because of the economics. They're doing it because they want money. And if you look at this, it says, by circumventing conservation and management measures and cutting or avoiding the operational costs associated with sustainable fishing practices and harvesting levels, entities engaged in stealing fish undermine the sustainability of fish stocks and the broader ecosystem. Further, IUU fishers gain an unfair advantage in the marketplace over law-abiding fishing operations as they do not pay the true cost. And so one of the ways, whether you come from the left side of the spectrum where you're focused completely just on, on the environmental side and conservation, cost is itself a conservation thing. It's also good for business to make sure that people like Bumblebee don't have to bear an unfair burden in fielding costs that they ordinarily wouldn't have to pay. And it's funny because David and I probably will disagree with many things, but when we're on the advisory council today, we're both the ones talking about the economics of it because ultimately it boils down to money and costs. So a couple of themes that I want to talk about uh, when you're talking about actually doing one of these investigations and how you being the policymakers can actually help here. Um, there are, I'm going to talk about some of the special challenges that law enforcement has in investigating a, an, an international poaching scheme. Uh, I want to walk through how it actually works. And, and that, will, I think, will help you as you're thinking through uh, proposed amendments, et cetera. Um, I want, one of the things that I always think about when I'm doing investigations is you, you can't walk in the forest without leaving a footprint. So where will the footprints necessarily have to be? Where do the criminals leave evidence? And when you actually crawl through the Congressman, Congresswoman's bill and the Port, Port Strait uh, Measures Act, it all gets to a lot of the issues that law enforcement needs to uncover um, these schemes and to investigate them and prosecute them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the recommendations and highlight how that leaps in with some of the lessons that you learn on the, on the ground, and then talk a little bit about some of the thoughts going forward. So um, I cut my teeth in this area by prosecuting a guy named Arnold Benjus, and, um, and Chris and I were talking about him earlier. Uh, he was a very, very famous and, well, and very wealthy South African uh, who moved to the United States and got citizenship and ran one of the biggest fish poaching and I illegal harvesting and, um, and smuggling schemes in history. Um, then I'm going to talk about the investigation and how we got him and put him away, and then we'll talk about the, the task force recommendations. Okay, so this is the part where how the scheme actually works. The scheme involved a, a, a source, a cost center in South Africa, and then a market in the United States. And the, the object of the scheme, at least the object that we ended up prosecuting, was both Patagonian toothfish, which is Chilean sea bass, and then rock lobster. And I got to a point where I knew all about rock lobster. And you can see the top, I know, because it's dark or hued, is West Coast rock lobster. And the reason I know that is because it's fished closer to the shore, and it's a higher elevation, so the pigment is darker. The one below is a lighter pigment, or lighter pigment, sorry, and uh, that's fished very deeply at sea. Um, ben just had this factor. If you've ever been in Cape Town, it's still there. This is prominent right out in the bay in Cape Town, and used um, state-of-the-art vessels to do his fishing, and also relied a fair amount on the local population of smaller fishermen to buy lobster from the smaller fishermen. Um, what did he do? On the South African side, it was a massive amount of overharvesting. In the year 2000, it was estimated by some of his compatriots that 90% of the West Coast rock lobster that he landed was illegal fish. 
Um, as with all of these things, and when you're doing crime, you've got a lot of illegal resource on one side, but you've got to pay your taxes, you've got to make reporting, and he had two sets of books, and they would literally call them sheet A and sheet B. With all of these things, as you're thinking them through, where do the bad guys have to leave evidence? And so you've got to keep books. You have, you have way too much fish coming in. Um, how do you get the fish actually into the harbor? Well, there's fisheries inspectors, so they bribed the fisheries inspectors, um, and they would offload at night. And again, how do you get evidence? Well, those are people you might end up talking to as you're getting evidence. Um, they would then export into the United uh, export to the United States into Asia. Well, if you're exporting 90% of your rock lobster being illegal, you can't say in every container full of rock lobster that you're sending out of South Africa that it contains rock lobster because you know full well that your numbers quickly will get over the amount that you're allotted under your quota, so you have to lie on the export documents. All right, And this gets right to the core of the Port States Measures Act, because that would really hit that. Um, and, um, and again, with all of these things, I always think about it as where do you leave evidence? So that's the supply side. Here's the impact on the fishery. I don't know if you can see this very well, but when the South Africans took down, before they took down uh, Benjus' um, factory and operation in South Africa, the population of South Coast rock lobster crashed. And when they took them out, you notice that it started coming back. And one of the things that we've seen, I was in South Africa recently, apparently the South Coast and West Coast rock lobster populations are healthy again. And this is just the impact in South Africa of one company. And this was the impact that, that we managed to stop. Okay, so in every scheme, there is a supply and there's a demand. And here, for our purposes, the demand was in the United States. Ben just had an operation in New York City, where I think uh, you knew some of his folks. And um, they also had a factory in Maine. They would import they would import things through New York City, which is how I got venue, because I was a federal prosecutor in Manhattan. Um, and here's an interesting thing. If you're bringing in all of this rock lobster into the United States, what do you do if customs opens the container? Well, you're not going to say that it's haddock. You're not going to say that it's, that it's pollock or anything else. Hake, why don't you just go ahead and say it's rock lobster? And so because you're afraid of U.S. customs, you put the correct amount on the U.S. customs documents. Okay, so then, again, where have you left evidence? Nice things about containers of fish is that they're all uniquely identified by numbers, and they all have seals on them, which I, go on the moment the, the container leaves the, the customs in South Africa, and that same seal has a unique identification number. So by focusing on the ports, that's a way that you can help stop um, the transportation of illegal fishing. Again, where do they leave evidence? Okay, so again, another portion of this is the money flow. You don't do these things without money. And just, if you think about it, you know, think it through. You're buying way too much rock lobster. You have to pay for the rock lobster. Um, you have extra harvesting costs because each of these lobsters has to be tailed. You have to hire people from your factory. 90% more production is a lot of money. It's a lot of gas, it's a lot of, uh, of electricity, it's a lot of people. Um, you have all these extra profits. What do you do with the extra profits? Where do you pay the crew? Um, you don't want to pay the crew of these boats in their bank accounts in South Africa because they're going to have too much money. Um, and so again, where do you leave the evidence? And it's a classic money laundering scheme. If I had been talking about narcotics, which I did a lot of narcotics cases over the years, it would look sort of like this, although rather than South Africa, that might be Colombia at the bottom. The fish comes to New York in red. The money goes back to South Africa. You have to send some money back to South Africa, or else the South Africans will know. Will know. But the rest goes to Switzerland or to other places in Europe where you can pay the fishermen extra money outside of South Africa or you, can, um, or you have to pay f um, your own profits and get them out of the United States. And, of course, where do you leave evidence? A federal prosecutor in New York can cut a subpoena to Citibank and watch out and figure out where those money flows are going. 
Okay, so that's how the scheme worked. So how did we catch them? Um, the South Africans got a tip, and they did a search in Cape Town at the factory there called Hout Bay Fishing Industries. They inspected a container, and lo and behold, they opened up the container, and the container contained something different than what was on the, the documents. And again, this gets to your Port States Measures Act, because if South Africa had had the standards that we would expect them to have back then, that would have been a really good thing. Um, in addition, wage records. I, in my past life, I worked on a fishing boat in Alaska, and I was the green man on the crew, and I knew that every red salmon that we pulled in was a dollar to me. All right? I just I had done that calculation, and so I would count, and everybody on a boat counts the amount of fish you have in. And there is no way that he can actually have the actual wage records being legitimate in-house or if he has them in-house, they're going to be hidden somewhere. So when the South Africans raided the, the place in, in Hout Bay, Ben just was in New York, and he called up his lieutenants, and he said, get the wage records out of the building. And, of course, I immediately knew why he was doing that, because the wage records were very, very bad incriminating, incriminating evidence. Um, export documents, as we said, and ultimately you start developing witnesses and cooperators. Um, all right, so the U.S. evidence. Again, we're the, we're the demand side of it. You look at the import documents. All right, well, you still need to figure out if there's anything wrong with the import documents, but you can also go to Icebrand's offices in New York and start looking at the two sets of records. Well, they tried to um, actually shred the records and put them in the trash can. And you talked about NOAA and, and marine fisheries. Uh, let me tell you about what those guys did. They are scary. They literally went through the trash and they pieced together the shredded sheet A and sheet B documents and reassembled that. I didn't even know it could be done, but that was pretty slick. And so they are scary. Um, and the money flow and the bank records are all things, obviously, that people like I were able to get through, um, through subpoenas. Um, then, and this is, I think the agents hated me for this, we brought over all of the export documents from South Africa. We took all the import documents from all these dozens and dozens of containers and put them all in a warehouse in New Jersey. The South Africans flew over and did a big con uh, comparison and matched up container by container. And lo and behold, as you guessed it, as you would from the Port States Measures Act, that the information didn't jive. And then we had them. Um, so South Africans ended up prosecuting a bunch of people. Um, they got 14 fisheries inspectors. Um, I'm told it was the largest public corruption case in South Africa until the Zuma matter. Um, they seized a bunch of lobster and boats, and, um, and Hout Bay Fishing Industry took a plea. Um, in the United States, we arrested Arnold Benjes and four others. Uh, we charged them under the Lacey Act and smuggling and conspiracy charges. Benjes got 46 months, and we ended up getting $7.4 in forfeiture. And then relatively recently, after a lot of fighting about the law, we ended up getting restitution to South Africa in the tune of about $30 million. And that's something where David and I have been really urging uh, the Advisory Council to really push for restitution, and there's some hope that that may find its way into the, the Feinstein Graham bill. That would be great. Um, this was the front page of the Cape Times, um, and this was when the restitution order came down, again in the front page of the Cape Times. Talk about deterrence. Um, so takeaways, um, and this I think gets to some of the presidential recommendations. Um, they exploit weaknesses in fisheries enfor enfor enforcement and ports. Uh, inspections. Corruption on the ground is huge. They mislabel the cargo. They exploit challenges that we have in cooperating internationally. And it's not just the United States and others, but across the board. And they use money laundering. Um, and how we catch them, I think it comes out from the examples, but we look into transparency into the seafood, and you'll see some of these themes reflected in the, in the, the recommendations and then in the Congresswoman's bill. Uh, Cross-border information sharing, um, law enforcement cooperation, tracing the money. You know, it goes back to Watergate, follow the money, right? Um, robust criminal enforcement statutes, um, having people go to jail for these things makes a big difference. 
um, and then restitution and compensation because it all boils down to money and cost and taking the true cost and placing it back where it belongs and making sure that the local countries get compensation is huge. Okay, briefly on the recommendations. I urge you to go ahead and read the recommendations. It's really important, it's, and you guys are the ones making policies, so take a look at it. Um, there are a few things that I wanted to identify that are useful, but you can see, using the example that I just went through, how, how these things all fit in. So, uh, for example, recommendation two, identify the best practices for catch documentation, data tracking, high seas boarding and inspection. Again, it gets down to what sort of fish is in the container? What do you know? And that ends up helping law enforcement ascertain whether you're cheating. Um, strength in fisheries governance and transparency in foreign and especially developing countries. Corruption on the ground, but also Port States Measures Act is huge for that. Custom enforcement tools. Um, and you see all of these things. I know, for example, the one that's right at second from the bottom, standardizing rules on identifying species, that's something where they need to work very closely with Chris and, and others to make sure that they do this right, but it's something that's important because you can't have Arnold Ben just saying, oh, it's, it's West Coast rock lobster when it leaves South Africa, when in fact it's South Coast rock lobster, or even worse, hake. You want some sort of way of matching up that, in fact, they're lying in South Africa and they're telling the truth in the States. A um, couple of things. Congressional legislation. Um, Congresswoman's bill, absolutely. The Port States Measures Act is, is key and is very important. Um, I think that one thing that comes out in, um, from the presidential recommendations or the task force recommendations is that NOAA's authority to actually inspect and seize fish is somewhat quirky and somewhat murky, I mean, and it would really be good to clarify that because everybody in this room would be sort of surprised that certainly customs can inspect and open and seize, but NOAA has its authority to do that is something that really needs to be clarified. Um, there is some holes, there's some holes in the Lacey Act, and the Lacey Act is really the number one most important statute in both the wildlife area and in the fisheries area, in, in the enforcement uh, uh, area. And there is an exception for um, fisheries that are governed by the Magnuson-Stevens Act. I think it's just a flaw. It needs to be plugged. And then there's the Wildlife Trafficking Enforcement Act that uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Graham are working on. Um, it's great. We love it. Um, it should be expanded. Right now, the definition of wildlife trafficking violations is just limited to sort of warm and cuddly charismatic species. It should include all wildlife, including fish, um, and just cover everything that, that is in the definition of wildlife. It's a, it's a minor fix, but they need to do it. Um, and I think you could, um, you should also bolster the, rec the restitution law in this area, and David and I have been working very closely with, with the, the task force on that. So, with that, any questions? Uh, do any of the recommendations involve the environment in which they fish, such as the use of dynamite or around coral reefs and stuff like that? Uh, it's, yeah. it's not that people don't use them. But most of those fishing practices are already banned. And yeah, they, it does encompass those types of activities. And let me add to that, that if you uh, harvested using dynamite and that was banned anywhere in the world, and then you brought that into the United States, that would violate the Lacey Act. And you, if you did it knowingly, you could be guilty of a felony. If you have had a chance to look at the presidential budget in relation to this and whether or not you think that what's in there is sufficient to address all these recommendations, that, uh, especially in NOAA and OLE and that kind of stuff. I think the first uh, 15 um, recommendations came out. You know, what, we, what our recommendation is in many cases is the U.S. government already has most of the tools they need problem is the different branches of government don't necessarily talk to one another. If you put together um, all of the different uh, regulations and rules and laws we have, we probably have most of what we need. And I think one of the biggest things we're pushing for is that we create one common database, meaning customs gets certain information, FDA gets certain information. And the FDA is more on food safety, customs is more, whether it's collecting tariffs, etc. But to expand basically the information that we collect all at one time, so that all the different parts of government can actually use the same information um, to ensure that the fish is coming into the U.S. legally. So there are there are clearly opportunities. We, we don't think there's a lot of 
additional legislation required to, to, to implement these recommendations. But again, I don't think we've gotten to the point where they've all been finalized yet. I really, I, I can't see that there's going to be a huge budgetary requirement, but I think it's early for that one. I, I do think, I, I, I agree, I actually don't know how much more money would be needed, if any, and, and, but I can tell you that one area that I think is probably going to be fruitful, if not now, but in the next 10 years, is really the scientific identification side of this. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that NOAA needs to be able to have the ability to seize and inspect. Um, actually getting in relatively quickly and on the ground in the port, um, an identification of what type of fish is really there will be very important. Just wondered if you had a comment on Pew's Eyes on the Sea project and their database and have you seen it? Um, it's pretty impressive and it sounds like a lot like what we kind of need here in the U.S. Are you aware of it? Is that the one that Gunnar Album was working on where um, where they were trying to focus on where the vessels actually were using VNS? It's, it's um, being developed by a British a uh, quasi-governmental company um, called Catapult Technologies, um, Catapult Satellite Technologies, and they have a data watch room, they have a virtual watch room where they can put up on the screen. Google's talked about doing this, but Catapult's actually done it. They have the data layers loaded onto their um, tool, and then they can look at fishing patterns of vessels, they can zoom in on them wherever they are, and then track them if they think they've done illegal fishing back towards the port that they're heading to. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with it. I think at an earlier stage there was a talk that Pew gave at Interpol in Leon, I think, a couple of years ago about yeah. this precise issue. And you start looking at the graphics, and it's interesting because you'll see, you know, ship going by, a ship going by, and then one will go right up to the Liberian coast and will go, you know, doing all this uh, this movement that's jagged, that, and they shouldn't be there at all. There's no, and they're plainly fishing. And, and that at least is a very good clue for somebody to focus on and build evidence, yeah. And so nobody has to build it. I mean, it's already built. The question is, could the Coast Guard or other law enforcement here in the U.S. have a person over there watching? Because they have the watch room, and they have an eye on every vessel that's got its finger on. They just, you know, need somebody to help them do the analysis. Is this a legal vessel, not a legal vessel? Where's its permit? And they have all the data layers built in, so they can zoom in and figure out what that vessel is, where it's flagged, what it usually fished, when it was last in port. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I think you have two questions there. Is that a role for Pew to play, or is that a role for governments to play? Um, and the other one does come back to the port states measures, meaning that, you know, right now, even if we can see that, th there's nothing that prevents that fish from going. And again, the way the port state measures works is if a country allows the unloading of illegal fish, then the U.S. and any other country that's treaty has the right to basically take action against that country for allowing the importation and handling of illegal fish. Yeah, Charles Gobain, I work for the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, and it was exactly the question that I wanted to raise. Uh, it's how we could uh, work and build on, on the experience of the EU. I mean, the policy has been, I mean, has been agreed uh, a few, few months ago, I mean, and implement, start just the implementation. And I wanted to know how um, either as a private sector or, or at the government level, we could, because it's a global issue, we, we could uh, seek more partner, a better partnership with the EU and, and to help the, the, the developing country to, uh, to improve their le legislation and, and enforcement. For those of you that don't know the European system, the Europeans used a soccer analogy. They basically rate every country green, yellow, or red. And whether, you, whether all of their measures are accurate or not, it doesn't matter. They went to Sri Lanka and gave Sri Lanka a yellow card. Sri Lanka didn't take action. Red card. Sri Lanka is no longer allowed to export any seafood to Europe. So now the Philippines have a yellow card. Guess what? The Philippines is scrambling like crazy to make the improvements that the EU has required. So again, it's not perfect, but it's clearly made, made the emphasis that you're going to lose access to one of the biggest markets in the world if you don't deal with control and traceability issues within fisheries. So again, I, I think from that reason, it's been extremely effective. And again, what we're trying to do with uh, the pirate fishing bill isn't that aggressive, but it's the first step in that direction.